Meet the Mr. Big of buried treasure. From a catalogue from Sotheby's? Yes. You sent that to Sotheby's? No. Yes, you did, because here's the piece of paper consigning it, lot number 361. Tonight, the secrets of a billion pound trade in stolen Greek and Roman antiquities, and how the smugglers do it. This beautiful silver and gold perfume bottle is one of the few items which escaped the attention of the Turkish tomb robbers who got away with what has become known as the Lydian Hoard, conservatively valued at around 10 million pounds. Which isn't surprising really, since it came from the kingdom of Croesus, the man who gave us the saying, as rich as Croesus. Behind this theft lies a tale of intrigue, of deceit, of greed, of theft, of smuggling, a curse and even violent death. Across Turkey and across the world, we've been investigating how the Lydian hoard and other great treasures have found their way into Western art collections. Despite Turkish and international law, nothing seems to stop the smugglers. And as we investigated, one name kept on coming up, Edip Telly. A man jailed for looting named him. So did the chief of Turkish police intelligence. So where is this man who has such tainted tentacles spanning the globe? The answer is that he's far away from the firing line. We tracked him down to Munich, where he now runs the outwardly respectable Griffos Gallery. From here, Edip Tully controls the lion's share of the trade in illicit Turkish antiquities, and Sotheby's in London has been a willing seller. This computer printout records one occasion when Sotheby's sold 18 items for Tully, including lot 361. Pictured in the catalogue as a Roman stele or tombstone. But would Sotheby's knowingly deal with someone who trades in goods which have been stolen or smuggled or both? Art gallery owner Peter Nahum, a former Sotheby's director, says they would. They would certainly turn a, a blind eye uh, to uh, if they knew that something had come from where it shouldn't. As long as it came into Sotheby's in, a, in a, a regular office, such as a Swiss office or a London office, then they would accept that as perfectly OK. And if they could... I don't... They wouldn't sell it if they didn't, couldn't get away with it, but if they could get away with it, they definitely would sell it. Uh, I would also say that, uh, that it knowingly deals in goods that have been either smuggled or stolen. Certainly smuggled. From the art world of London to that of New York, the trade in stolen antiquities is a scandal, a largely untold scandal so far. The Metropolitan Museum of Art, outwardly a picture of perfect probity, is no stranger to this scandal. It's built its classical collections by turning a blind eye for years, according to former Met director Tom Hoving. Did the museums know they were illegal? But they certainly knew that they didn't come from Boston. They didn't come from an archaeological excavation in Nevada. They did not, they were not found underneath the freeway, right? From a Greek village that existed in the outskirts of Los Angeles. I mean, come on, everybody knows where they come from. They come from Turkey or Italy. Mostly from Turkey, because all of the great civilizations passed through Turkey. They left behind them untold treasures priceless buildings, statues, and works of art. 
It has been said that there's more buried treasure in this part of the world than in Greece and Italy put together. A couple of weeks ago, somebody chiseled the faces off this marble frieze. Now, there's no legal market for antiquities of this sort inside Turkey, so the vandalism has but one reason, to smuggle those faces out and sell them illegally to a rich collector or a museum in the West. Perhaps the most spectacular robbery of all was plotted here, in the blacksmith's shop in the village of Guri. Inside this tumulus, or burial mound, Osman Unsal, then the blacksmith, found silver and gold treasure, now worth at least 10 million pounds. First, he tried tunneling into the tomb, but was defeated by the lead-lined marble doors. Undaunted, he dug down into the burial chamber from above. I could just squeeze through the hole, lit a lantern and looked around. He found himself in a tomb undisturbed for 2,500 years. I was scared, I'll tell you. On the stone couches, the remains of two bodies. A handful of grey hair was left on one body. Both crumbled to dust as I touched them. There was treasure all around them, and slowly I began to hand things out one by one. A silver bowl with 19 bearded faces. Silver perfume bottles, more than a hundred items, all the time making a list so nothing went missing. But it went wrong. The police were tipped off and a gunfight followed, after which Osman was arrested. Some of his co-looters got away with the best of the loot, but for the robber called Dermush, there was no escape. The curse of the tomb got him. Durmush was paralyzed, his brother-in-law killed by a tractor, his wife died and his son was shot. And I know it was all because of the curse. The curse passed us by because we didn't make any money. We went to prison instead. Documents prove that the treasure Osman unearthed, by now called the Lydian Horde, was smuggled from Turkey via Munich directly to New York through the Telly family's own export-import company. Director General, how big is the problem of stealing and smuggling of antiquities from Turkey? This is genuinely a very big problem for us. We're trying to deal with it in different ways. We're trying to get back smuggled goods, we're trying to stop illegal digs, and we're trying to educate our own folk. But because of the huge buying power of the West, this illegal trade is very difficult to control. In New York, it's always been denied that the Lydian hoard belongs to Turkey. So we took the man who dug it up to the Metropolitan Museum. They refused to cooperate with us, saying that the hoard is now the subject of a legal dispute. But for Osman, it's beyond dispute. Yes, these are definitely the pieces I found. I made notes and drawings. I remember, even after all these years, I remember that jug, those silver bottles, the thing with the hen on top, that distinctive bowl. All these things I took from that tomb. One by one, I recognized the pieces. They've cleaned them very well, but these objects belong to Turkey and I want them returned. I want America to hand them back to Turkey. The Brooklyn Museum, like the Metropolitan, appears to ignore the 1974 UNESCO Treaty. This was intended to outlaw the trade in recently excavated artifacts like this sarcophagus. Its twin is in Antalya, in southern Turkey. So how do the Turks know? This is the same hand and the same workshop. So there is no way the government would have allowed that sarcophagus no, out of the country legally? No, 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 no. Occasionally, the police or customs are able to stop valuable pieces from being smuggled out. This packing case was described as containing toy doll casts. It actually concealed a statue of Demeter, the goddess of plenty. Once these antiquities have left Turkey, 
Where do they go? Where's the, where's the crossroads for this trade? It goes to Europe, specifically to Munich and Germany, which is a collection and distribution center. Unfortunately, much more gets through than we're able to stop. We know that it's bought in by Edith Tully and is distributed by Edith Tully to various museums and collectors around the world. We've made requests through Interpol and also through diplomatic channels for his arrest and return from Germany. So far, this has produced no results, but we hope it will. Small time dealers inside Turkey are caught fairly often, but the biggest of them all remains safely out of reach. More than five years after that Interpol request, Telly still runs the smuggling business from the Griffos Gallery in the center of Munich. Fleeing from arrest in Turkey, he was shrewd enough to take German nationality to protect himself from extradition. The Turkish authorities know it's Edip Telly and his cohorts who are making the real money, whilst the peasants who do his dirty work are paid but a few dollars. But in a country as poor as Turkey, that's a fortune, and it's created a kind of gold rush mentality. Metal detectors abound. Someone had found a coin, so I decided to have a go with my detector. It made a noise. We started digging and out came a thousand coins. We went crazy. I wanted to hand them all to the police, but the others begged me not to. But within three months we were under arrest. We sold the coins in the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul and the police became suspicious because the others bought houses and cars. I did a year in prison. Amongst the booty, 14 of the world's most coveted coins, decadrachmas worth half a million dollars each, most sold by Telly direct to an American billionaire. So, Ahmed, you ended up in prison, made very little money, and who made the real money? The man who made the real money from this business is Edip Telly and his people who sold the treasure in America. He never gets caught. As for us, we were left totally empty-handed. We suffered in the place of Edip Telly. In Istanbul's covered bazaar, we sought out the men who often serve as collectors for Edip Telly. Back in the villages, peasants who unearth valuables often have no choice but to pass them on down the Telly pipeline. One man who got in Telly's way was told he'd be sealed in a shipping crate. Another was blinded. In search of a way into the Telly pipeline, we made an appointment to meet a man with much to offer, Al Pajlan Kötarici. Uh, Graham, like the box. Sarcophagus? Yeah. Mm -hmm. On side, uh, lots of relief statues, mm -hmm. pictures. Uh, you interested? Yes, very. Kotarici offered to travel remote roads like this through an ancient city of the dead. Here, amongst the many sarcophagi, he promised to find us a good, well-decorated example. I can cut in it. I can cut in it in the stone uh, factory. I can cut very well, portative, pratic, yes. uh, not so much kilogram. Today, one and a half kilograms. One, one and a half ton after probably 300 kilograms. I can send you. And then reassemble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. He was offering to cut up a 2,000-year-old sarcophagus and ship it like pack-flat furniture. After all, all the operations have been done, it's going to become about 20 kilograms. The price, 11 million Turkish lira, was less than 2,000 pounds delivered to Munich, but worth perhaps a hundred times as much to an unscrupulous collector or museum. But before we moved on to Germany, there was the little matter of the articles consigned to Sotheby's in May of 1988 by Edip Telly, including lot 361, this Roman tombstone. Was it stolen or smuggled? 
our archaeological advice was that such gravestones or stele only came from a particular area. So could we find something similar? Eventually, in a remote village called Gürtchile, we found something that looked very similar, newly erected as a village fountain. It was time to compare paperwork with stonework. The lions at the top looked identical to the ones in the catalogue. This stele was moved into the centre of the village for safekeeping after the telly men came by and stole its twin from the original fountain they once both adorned. The village headman and friends were anxious to see for themselves the results of our research. That's it. There it is. It's the same one. When I was a boy, I used to play around this stone. It's the one I remember best, the one that stayed in my memory. And there's a key engraved on it. And look, there's a key engraved on this one too. There you go. It's the same. The villagers got up a petition asking Sotheby's to arrange for the prompt return of their precious stele, which had seen fountain service for many centuries. They asked us to deliver it. But first, back to Munich and a call on Mr. Telly. My name is Roger Cook from Central Television. I'm here to talk to you about your part in the international antiquities trade. You do have a lot to do with it. Your family's been involved in smuggling for 20 years. Is that your name? Yes. That's your name? That's your signature? Italy, yes. Yes. Well, that was the Decadrachma hoard, which was stolen from Turkey. No, I don't know. Yes, you do. No, I'm not. Then the Lydian hoard. There's paperwork on that, too. I have no time, please. I have not thought. You have. You've been involved in this trade please. for years. You've even frightened people. You have yes. frightened people please. who've got in your way. No, no, don't push me. Don't push me. Thank you very much. You have been involved in the smuggling of antiquities. You must before Andropen. Randuwe. That's okay. I don't speak German. You speak yes. perfectly good English. No. You too, because our office has <coughs> spoken to you, and you obviously understand me. Now, you have been involved in this trade for a very long time. Awesome. Please. And people who have got in your way yes. have got into trouble, haven't they? Oh, I have not. Cambridge, home to one of the world's foremost archaeologists. Professor Colin Renfrew is Disney Professor of Archaeology and Master of Jesus College. He thinks that the burgeoning trade in illegal antiquities should concern us all. Well, it's disastrous because it what fuels the looting of sites, and that means that the archaeological record is being systematically destroyed. And that means that our hope of really understanding the human past is being undermined. Sometimes, just sometimes, the Turks succeed in having some of their treasures returned. Their Swiss lawyers are currently fighting on seven fronts. But however hard they try, they can't stop their heritage from disappearing. At the centre of the latest row with America is a statue. It's of Hercules, god of strength. This is where Hercules was exhumed. Shortly after he was dug up, Thieves made off with his torso and his head. So now his top's in New York, his legs are in Turkey, and there's a legal battle royal to bring them back together again. Put simply, the Americans deny that the bottom half in Turkey matches the top half in Boston. Put together, albeit electronically, the pieces fit perfectly. So why do the collectors deny logic as well as morality? It's greed. Uh... It's a desire, it's a lust for gold, to have, to own, to possess these objects. Uh, there's money, there's profit to be made, money for, uh, from the sale, principally, of objects passing through the hands of the auction houses. The world's leading auction house refused an interview, 
saying that with Sotheby's volume of business, it was inevitable stolen items would occasionally slip through. But dealing regularly with telly is hardly a slip. One of the focuses of interest in our programme has been Sotheby's. What do you think of their role in this? Well, I think in some cases it is clear that they know they are selling antiquities which must have been looted. Uh, and uh, it doesn't seem to cause them to pause in the enterprise. Uh, now, if I'm right in that, and I, it really seems perfectly clear to me that is so in some cases, then I think it is rather disgraceful because they are therefore taking part actively in the system which is destroying our cultural heritage, the world's cultural heritage, and I think that's very regrettable. This is Felicity Nicholson, director of Sotheby's Antiquities Department. And this is a signed personal review in which she said to find the occasionally shady side of the business not uncongenial. And this is a telex making an appointment for her with Edip Telly in 1986. Let me show you something else which is interesting. This is a from a catalogue from Sotheby's. Yes. You sent that to Sotheby's? No. Yes, you did, because here's the piece of paper consigning it, lot number 361. Yeah, I have not, please. That is your... You sent that to no, Sotheby's? No, And that was stolen from Turkey. We've traced it back I to the not. village where it came from. I have not. Is that your name? Edip Telly? Yes. Right. Number 361? Yes. Number 361. It's stolen from mine. Turkey? Yes, not mine. Please. Stolen from Turkey? Okay. It, it was, was stolen, wasn't it? Okay. And Sotheby's have I'm actually... sorry, I'm not tempted. Sotheby Sotheby's have sold stolen goods on your behalf. You obviously haven't got a very good answer, have you, Mr. Telly? Who knows to whom Mr. Telly spoke next? But surely Sotheby's knew that in dealing with the likes of Telly, they were virtually bound to be receiving stolen goods and then having to cover up for it. Of course they would. I mean, what else would you expect? I mean, do you expect them to admit do you expect anybody to admit to dealing in goods that have a very questionable history and may have been illegally exported? But well, what I'm saying is it company policy. Was it company policy, to your knowledge, to, to do just that? Absolutely. Indeed, Sotheby's telexes show they use code words to disguise what their clients have bought. And this memorandum talks about avoiding the customs men and getting tracks covered comprehensively. Miss Nicholson. Hello. My name is Roger Cook from Central Television. Oh, yes. I'd like to give you this petition. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a petition from the village of Goethe yeah. where a stolen artifact came from that you sold as lot 361. Dealing as you do with Edith Telly, a man with an appalling reputation. Would but you I'm like to explain? Do you want to take the petition? They would like the stolen goods back. Please take, please, take, please take position. Thank you. Meanwhile, this destructive billion dollar trade goes on. smashed open top of a Roman sarcophagus. There used to be three in here. This is the last remaining bit of some of the relief from around the outside. This handle end is all that's left of a ceremonial cup. Absolutely everything from within this tomb has been stripped out. The thieves would have made a few pounds. On the black market in the West, the contents of this place would have been worth hundreds of thousands. Today, Sotheby's will have received a letter from Turkey's Swiss lawyers demanding details of the connection between Lot 361 and Edip Telly.